just supposed to be a general discussion of cultural practices. So I've got some short slides, but what I normally find on panel sessions is if you get the speakers up and they have another PowerPoint, you don't get any discussion. So I will probably defer and not use mine. Would, well, no, that's fine. So, so why don't you go ahead, and it may be mo much more important in this session just for you to ask the questions that you want to get answered. Have these guys do a brief intro, and I can either go through this or not, and then we'll, uh, what I think we really want to do is uh, generate some good discussion. So, but as I always challenge my audiences and my grad students, and uh, when I do teach on campus, is that you go to conferences, you look around, you look at different things, and you say, okay, what are they doing there? And I've got all this local knowledge, I know my climate, I know my soils, how can I adapt what they do there? The other thing I always tell my graduate students is you have to always be careful to challenge your assumptions. If you don't have data about something and you assume something, it can get you into trouble. And I'll, I'll, I'll mention one example, uh, talking about canola and irrigating and blooming. Years ago when we were doing, really getting into fertigation on corn, there was a wives' tale or an assumption that people had that you should not put nitrogen fertilizer on when the corn was pollinating or maybe not irrigate. And I said, wait a minute, it rains all the time back in Illinois and Iowa when the corn is pollinating. And so we had guys look at it. It made absolutely no difference if you put on nitrogen fertilizer and or irrigated during pollination. The thing is, in a very dry climate like you have and like we have in western Nebraska, when you irrigate, your relative humidities are high for a very short period of time because you get all that evaporative cooling. It's not like growing canola in Kentucky when you get a rain and it stays moist and humid and you have a long period. So again, when you think about practices, think about, you know, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but think about challenging your assumptions, okay? Just a, an idea from an old professor. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our cultural practices and uh, we'll go through this stuff. And it's re really about deficit irrigation and in areas that are facing this um, it's r really what happens, and so stress develops during the season. Just you can kind of click, just hit the enter button. Or the down button. The enter arrow. Yeah. Any stress relates to ET reduction. Okay, because of, of the linear yield ET relationship, when you suppress ET, you suppress yield. Okay. Keep going. When you have deficit irrigation, which we have many of our irrigators facing this year, because I talked earlier about we have these water allocations. These water allocations are two, three, four years. If you use up most of your allocation, we have people in this fourth year that normally have 14 inches because they pumped so much last year. They only have seven inches this year. There is no leeway. They're up against the wall. They will get a new allocation next year. And so they've got what I call a planning problem and a management problem, okay? And any place where you are subject to an uncertain water supply, um, this, is, this is a problem. So again, the response of the crop to irrigation is a curvilinear. Most of our crops have been bred that when you over-irrigate, that line does not go down anymore. It doesn't on corn, it doesn't on a lot of crops. It, it does on wheat. I mean, I can, I can have lodged wheat, and I can go in and pick it up by hand, which I do on my plots, and the yield is still less. So, but a lot of times it doesn't go down. Go ahead. So, yield irrigation, next. There's the yield ET line, next. The differential between those two are really your inefficiencies, your non-ET losses, okay? So at the low levels of irrigation, your ET losses aren't that great. As you apply more water, you're more and more inefficient. Every crop has a yield ET curve, okay? Hit it. But those slopes change between crops. They are not static with time. They change with aridity. They move back and forth. And, but the relative relationship stays the same. So what I'm doing on my canola 
um, the earlier work was basically in, in a conventional clean till situation. I've been growing canola no-till, and here's my rotation. I grow winter wheat, which is followed by corn, which is followed by dry beans, and then I put my canola into the no where the dry beans were, and then after canola, I go back to wheat. I really like that system for my wheat in the Great Plains. The, uh, the wheat, beans, and canola get 4, 8, and 12 inches. Corn gets 5, 10, 15. And those top levels, as I mentioned this morning, if I need more, I will because those are set at a non-ET limiting. But a dry plot goes back on a dry plot goes back on a dry plot. Okay. My production practices in this. Um, I round up the bean stubble uh, in the spring if I've got anything and then usually one roundup application at the six leaf stage. Usually I never get to that other six ounces that you're supposed to be able to put on and it probably wouldn't do any good anyway. Um, seeding rate, uh, we're planting seven to eight pounds of seed per acre. I'm planting in seven and a half inch rows. Um, about middle of April, I do use, it's really important for us to use helix treated seed because flea beetle is our main insect problem. Other insects I really have not had a problem with. I use pre-plant, a small amount of nitrogen, about 20 pounds. I use ammonium sulfate. I don't think I need 20 pounds of sulfur. I think I could get by with 10 for the yields that I've got. And then my other nitrogen I come on and I put on um, at just before blooming and I put the remainder on. All of my nitrate levels are based on soil nitrate tests. I kind of use the equation that we came up with that's, that's in that Great Plains canola guide. I worked on that chapter with uh, Dave Mengel at KSU. And so it's not too bad. Um, eight is probably a better factor times expected yield than nine. Nine is probably a little high. Um, and following dry beans, which fix some nitrogen on our shallow rooted crop, I'm using my canola as a scavenger crop to pick up residual nitrate that has, is there. Um, and we're harvesting usually in early August. Okay, so what does limited irrigation look like, or deficit irrigation? You get the crop up and growing, you have to treat it like a dryland crop. If you've got a limited amount of water, you want it around that flowering period. Because for us, you don't, that will give you your greatest chance to have a good seed set. And uh, so I'm, you know, early on I had to put on in this dry year some low irrigations. And then, uh, you know, that's quite a few irrigations. But what I'm trying to do there in a dry, hot year is to give the water, the, give the plant enough water so it keeps flowering. Because if you don't and it goes into stress, it stops flowering. And every day of flowering that you lose, you're losing yield potential. So you're trying to maximize your opportunity for yield potential. You may never realize it, but you, if you never get to where you can fill those pods, you, you've already lost yield potential, okay? The next slide shows in a wet year. In a wet year, I may not even use the four inches. I can get by till afterwards, and I'm putting that water on, not really near the end, but if you figure a growing cycle, you know, in weeks after planting, from planting till harvest of about 18 weeks, which is for us, I'm putting that water on at week 13, 14, and I'm not putting it on later then because of problems. And again, we have never seen a problem irrigating, uh, well, go ahead. If you have more water, you spread it out more, okay? This is in a dry year, in a wet year, you can conserve water and use it on some other crop. Again. Our farmers have this minds, we have this allocation, so where can I move that water around to make the most money, you know? Go ahead. Full irrigation, you got lots of water. Next one. Only four and a half inches to produce a fully irrigated crop, and this year I probably produced about 3,000 pounds an acre, okay? So here are my canola yields over the last six or seven years. All in all, not too bad. Here's my simulated dry land yields, but it's, it, it's a call my cheating dry land yield because it's, we got it up and growing at least, you know. It's amazing what a half an inch of water, two quarter inch shots will do to get canola germinated and going. Um, 
Some years, no difference. Look, over, my six-year yield average over here does not include 2012. 2012, it was hot and dry. We started out, we, we ran five inches above our long, five degrees above our no, long-term normal temperature, starting in March through July. July is always hot. We were only one degree hotter. Um, that's our primary growing season. Regardless, putting 12 inches of water on, this was never under stress. I got 820 pounds. Canola does not like hot weather. Most of the time, even in our fairly hot climate, you know, we're, we're, we're doing okay. You know, we get some exceptional years, but you know, those are, those are not bad averages for what we've got. So what you do is when you get enough data like this, and this is what we're trying to develop for our irrigators that face deficit, is okay, say, you take your yield in one year, we assume that this is our non-ET limiting, we just create a percentage, okay, and then we were able to set boundaries. We set, do these production functions from the wettest and driest years, they provide an upper and lower boundary of the worst and best case scenario. Seven and 12 were the dries we've seen in the last century. Oh, nine was one of the wettest. So I've encompassed, luckily, in the short time that I've been there, what I think are the boundary conditions of the best and worst. Okay, go ahead to the next one. So you do a bunch of these, go to the next one. So now I've established my boundaries. In a wet year, I can get by with four inches. In a worst year, 10 inches. So this helps you in your management of planning, knowing what kind of year to help you start thinking about as a grower, okay, maybe this year, well, I can afford to put six inches on canola, but then I'll have more for my potatoes or whatever else, okay? So, and again, all of this information we're trying to generate to put into this program called Water Optimizer. I understand Washington State has something similar. When I got all this money from RMA, Marshall English at Oregon State had a similar grant, was working on a similar program. Marshall retired a year ago or so. I don't know whether they've continued to develop these, but these things are not static. You need people working on them all the time. Um, but uh, there's the URL for the program. It's an Excel spreadsheet. You just download it. If you know enough about Excel, you have to go into the options and the add-ins. You have to activate something in Excel called Solver. And once you activate Solver, then all of these routines within the program work. But it basically is a software program that has a suite of models. You can essentially look at a single field, single year. You can look at a single field, multiple years in terms of water allocations. You can look at a single year, multiple fields. You can set it, as I mentioned this morning. You grow corn, soybeans, you're 50-50. You can force it to say, I'm 50-50. It will tell you how to divide your water. If you have total flexibility, it will tell you where you make the most money. And I can tell you with $7 corn, it's hard to have anything compete with $7 corn, okay? The only thing that may compete right now is $80 sugar beets, which we got last year in, in our part of the world. We, you know, sugar beets are a good option, especially now with Roundup Ready. We've gone from average yields of 25 to 26 tons an acre up to 35 tons an acre. Multiply 80 by 35, eh, it's pretty good money. Okay, these are the crops that are included in it. It allows you to play what if games. Again, you may never want to use water optimizer. You may want to look at it and play with it and take it back to the science folks in your area and say, we need something like this. You know, how are we going to come up with the money to do this or how can we tweak this one to do that as, as a management planning tool? So when you have significantly less water, you have to modify your normal irrigation. You can't do like the ag engineers tell you all the time, okay, you're gonna do it. go in and get Penman Monteith values of ET and um, put on so much. No, you have to time that water when you're gonna get the biggest bang for the buck. So what's your objective? You're gonna win the yield contest or you're gonna win the money contest? How does your strategy change based on your cropping mix? So you have to look at what you have that fits 
your operation. So when you're deficit irrigate, you have to think like a drylander. And most irrigators who are longtime irrigators, that's very hard for them to do. But people who are drylanders and became irrigators adopt the concept very easily. You have to do everything in terms of good cultural practices, store all the moisture, use residue management, uh, modify plant populations, modify fertilizer on the basis of some expected yield, which you hopefully have some background information to know what that is. Get a good stand, a good start. Forget about regular weekly scheduling of ET. Let the crop grow into early stress without killing it. And then like for corn, a limited amount of water, you put it on around tassel emergence. Wheat, you put it on around flowering, very early grain fill. Um, canola, if we have it, we start putting it on a flowering where we try to extend that flowering date. We run out, we run out. Hopefully we'll catch a rain. You know, our rainfall distribution is very different than yours. Fertilizer, you develop your plans based to meet your financial goals. Okay. Unexpected yields. Immobile nutrients, generally I say you're going to need to follow soil tests because regular soil tests really are to keep you at that critical level. You know, if, you've, if you're above there, there and you're going to have deficit irrigation, why spend money on immobile nutrients? Those soil tests do not change rapidly. You know? No penalties for over-application, but you know, that's money that maybe you should have left in the bank. Okay. Should base it on yield gold. You can do that with corn, beets, and beans. Remember that if you shoot for an 80% yield in nitrogen, you can pro it'll probably, if you have a good year, it'll probably still produce a 90%. Question the use of anything that doesn't give you a return. Somebody said potassium in the Great Plains. We have high potassium. You know, I personally have farms and a family corporation, I almost want to write into my lease with my tenants, except I don't want to micromanage. I will not pay my portion if you buy potassium. Our soils are in 400 to 500 ppm. You know, I haven't done that yet, but you know, I've thought about it. It's the problem of having a PhD soil fertility guy as your landlord. Okay, so what you need to do and think about is you need to develop one of these for you if this is your situation. So. Keeping up with the changing times, good old American Gothic, and there's the new version. <laughs> okay. Now, think about that in the context and then ask these local guys more questions. <laughs>